والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Welcome to more hadith from the book of Bulugh al-Maram that talks about matters of fiqh, jurisprudence, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the perfect way, following the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, and getting the benefits from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're still in the chapter of water, which is the subject of purification. This is what we use to make wudu to take a shower, to be able to stand in the salah and perform the most important act of worship in the life of the Muslim. Hadith that Ibn Hajar rahimahullah mentioned here about a man that came to the masjid. جَاءَ أَعْرَابِي فَبَالَ فِي طَائِفَةٍ مَسْجِدْ فَزَجَرَهُ النَّاسِ فَنَهَاهُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَلَمَّا قَضَى بَوْلَهُ أَمَرَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم بذنوب من ماء فأهريق عليه this hadith which is a short version of the same hadith a Bedouin came and urinated in one corner of the mosque and the people shouted at him but Allah's messenger وسلم, stopped them and when he finished urinating the Prophet وسلم, ordered for a bucket of water which was spilled over it and this hadith agreed upon this hadith has more than one version to it and has more details to it. But the point the hadith is mentioned here in this chapter, it shows that there was impurities in the masjid, which is the urine. And Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, as if he's trying to say here, that this impurity does it not make, or does it make the water that we use for wudu valid or not? The hadith shows that a Bedouin came and he entered the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. When he entered, he saw the masjid. How simple was the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ? So he thought that this is something that he can urinate in. Not knowing the mannerism that the Prophet ﷺ used to teach the companions. Someone coming did not have the, the mannerism that the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions. He entered the masjid. He thought that it's permissible to urinate inside the masjid, the house of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So he took a side and he started urinating. So the people, they shouted at him and they were about to forbid this evil, such an evil for someone to spread the impurities in the house of Allah in the masjid. But it shows the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ forbade them from doing so. He told them, wait, la tazrimu, as one of the narrations of the hadith means, do not cut on him what he is doing. And this is the wisdom of Allah, of the Prophet ﷺ that the ulama they mention here, why did the Prophet ﷺ tell them not to do so? First, not to hurt that person because already the impurity is there. If he would be prevented before the impurity would fall into the ground of the masjid, it would have been different. But the impurity is already there. And when they do this, if they try to stop him, they might hurt him physically. He might get hurt by trying to stop himself from urinating. And another wisdom behind it, that if they try to forcefully prevent him from finishing urinating on the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the, on the ground of the masjid, that would cause the impurity to even spread more. Instead of being concentrated in one area, it would spread more. So it shows a very important lesson for the Muslim. When there is an evil being present, and for someone to forbid the evil, they have to think and ponder over the matter. If as a result of forbidding the evil, a bigger evil would occur, then it's not permissible to forbid that specific evil by removing it physically. Otherwise, more evil would occur. And as it's mentioned in this example. Anyway, matters of fiqh, matters of impurities, the Prophet ﷺ stopped them. And then after this Bedouin finished urinating, the Prophet ﷺ ordered for a bucket of water to be spilt on the impurity. And this was enough. That shows that once the impurity is disappeared, when it disappeared, that means the matter or the place is clean. 
because the place has to be clean. How to clean it? To clean it with water. And once the place is clean, then the matter is over. Some went to an extreme of saying that we have to remove this place of the earth from the masjid. This is something that is of extreme opinion. The correct opinion, as we heard from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it was enough for a bucket of water to be spilled over it. The sand was the place or was the, 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 the ground of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, so the bucket of water would take care of it. But for someone, for example, to say that if the urine was on the carpet, as the masjid are now, or on hard floor, for example, in homes, can a person just bring a cup, bucket of water and spill it over it? This might even make the najasa or the impurity spread more. So in that case, the goal is to remove the impurity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make it an act of worship for us to remove the impurity. There is no special rituals in removing the impurities. We are ordered to remove impurities. Whatever means possible for us to remove the impurities, this is what is meant by the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So a person can bring a sponge, for example, and clean and dry the urine and then clean with water afterwards or with soap and water and things of that nature. This is all permissible. This is all something that is good as long as the place is back to its original state, that it's pure again in which the person is able to make or perform the salah. So this is what we learn from the hadith. Also in another narration, that this Bedouin, when he saw how the companions, عنهم, they were so angry, and how he saw the Prophet ﷺ with his wisdom, and he explained to him in a very nice way and words that this is not permissible to be done in the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Bedouin made dua, and he said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and Muhammad وسلم, and none else. So the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he told them, you made what is so vast, you made it very narrow. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so vast. Don't ask for the mercy of Allah just to me and you, meaning, but for everyone else. But it shows how he was affected by the way the Prophet ﷺ taught him, which makes us learn that when a person is ignorant about a ruling, it is not permissible for us to deal with the matter with harshness. He doesn't know the ruling. When a person first time coming to the masjid did something wrong, it is our duty to teach him, but to teach the person is in, in a nice manner, in a gentle manner, because he doesn't know what is right and what is wrong. The same thing for young individuals and things of that nature. We have to differentiate between someone. He knows the ruling, and he knows that this is not permissible. He knows that he will be dishonoring the masjid, the mosque, and he still, for example, did such a horrific act. Uh, to deal with him is different matter, but now we're talking about someone that didn't know the rulings as we heard from the hadith. So we benefit from this, that the impurity can be removed from the place where we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on by cleaning it with water. And as long as it's removed, as long as it's pure, then it's permissible for the person to make the salah. The next hadith, the Prophet sallallahu talked about uh, certain things that is pure for us. Two dead animals that are permissible for us to eat, and two forms of blood. The Prophet ﷺ said, أُحِلَّتْ لَنَا مَيْتَتَانْ وَدَمَانْ فَأَمَّا الْمَيْتَتَانْ فَالْجَرَادُ وَالْحُوتْ وَأَمَّا الدَّمَانْ فَالْكَبِدُ وَالطُحَالْ The Prophet ﷺ said that two types of dead animals and two types of bloods have been made lawful for us. The two types of dead animals are locusts and fish, meaning seafood while the two types of bloods are the liver and the spleen. This hadith was reported by Imam Ahmad ibn Majah, and this hadith has some weakness to it. But it is the opinion of the ulama, based on this hadith and others, that it is permissible for us to, meet, to eat the locusts, although it's not to be slaughtered, right? Uh, a person can eat it, meaning after it's been dead, and also the hut, which is the seafood, the things that live in the sea or the ocean, it's permissible for us to eat. We don't have to slaughter it, which is something that is all, uh, already known. What a man and two forms of blood. Blood is not permissible for us when it's masfuh, when it's gushing out, when a person is slaughtering the animal. This is, becomes impure. But if the blood after slaughtering the animal stays in the veins or stays in the skin after the blood gushed out and finished, this is, of course, something that is little and uh, something that a person can never avoid. So it's permissible in that case, as the ulama they say. 
But the liver and the spleen are both permissible for the Muslims to eat, although they are blood. But it's permissible for us, which means that blood, to drink blood of an animal or things of that nature, of course, it's not permissible for us to use the gushing blood. But blood staying in the skin of the animal that are permissible for us to eat, there is no harm in it because it's something that is little and uh, can never be avoided. There are two more hadiths left in the chapter of, al -water, uh, of the water, of the miyah. The one before last, the Prophet ﷺ talked about the fly, or the house fly, when it falls in one's cup that he's drinking from. What should a person do? The hadith reported by Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا وَقَعَ الذُّبَابُ فِي شَرَابِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلْيَغْمِسْهِ ثُمَّ الْيَنْزَعْ فَإِنَّ فِي أَحَدَ أَحَدِ جَنَحَيْهِ دَا وفي الآخر شفاء خرجه البخاري وأبو داود وزاد وإنه يتقي بجناحه الذي فيه الداء which means the Prophet ﷺ said when a fly falls in the drink of one of you he should fully dip it and then throw it away because there is a disease in one of its wings and cure in the, in the other and this hadith was reported by Al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood who added it meaning the fly protect itself with the diseased wing by dipping it first in a drink. This hadith shows that if a fly falls into one's cup, uh, if he still wants to drink the water or the liquid that he's drinking, then he should dip it fully and then throw it away. And then if he drinks it, no harm would afflict him. As we know, the fly is something that uh, any person would uh, dislike to drink after it falls into one's drink because of the diseases that can be transmitted. But if the water is scarce, if the person wants to drink anyway, then there is no harm on him as long as he do what the Prophet ﷺ ordered by dipping it fully and then throwing it away and then to drink it. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the wisdom behind this. Because in one wing, if there is a disease in one wing carrying a microbe or a virus or whatever there is, the other wing automatically is formed in it, the cure to the disease on the first wing. And this is a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ that to, uh, not too long ago, that people used to attack the religion of Islam through this hadith and other hadith that says, how can that happen? How can the Prophet ﷺ tell the people to drink from a cup that a bug or a fly uh, fell in it, the house fly? But it shows the miraculous wordings of the Prophet ﷺ when, when they recently discovered uh, with the tests and the lab tests that this is true. For us as Muslims, it doesn't ma matter to us. It doesn't make a difference to us because this is the words of the one that has been revealed to him, which is the Prophet ﷺ. We take his words and we know that this is the truth. But it shows something that if an impurity falls, oh, as far as the house fly is concerned, this is how to cure it. The last hadith in the chapter, which means whatever portion is cut off from an animal, when it is alive, is dead meaning it's a dead meat, it is not permissible for us to eat. Something that is alive, if a portion of it or an organ is cut off, it be considered as a dead, that means it's not permissible for us uh, to eat. And this has uh, differences of opinion. And this is not including the hair or the wool on the sheep or things like that. This is permissible to be used. But if it's a, an arm or a leg or whatever is being cut off, can a person use it or not? The correct opinion is not to use it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. With this, we finish the book or the chapter of water and we continue next time, inshallah ta'ala, with the aniya, with the chapter of utensils where the water are sometimes put in for the people to make wudu or to take a bath. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.